By using the same pricing model that brands are used to, which is CPM, if they're using Facebook ads, Google, or anything else, it makes it a lot easier to make that transition for them. So plus, you also have the upside upside as a creator of billing against your viral episodes. You know, the cookie cutter approach of CPM just lacks flexibility and freedom. And as a creator, this is why we are in the game monetizing. We want that flexibility. We want that freedom. And we're able to set our own rates. Okay. Welcome to Creator Debates, where we have stupid arguments to help creators make smart decisions. My name is Justin Moore. I'm the founder of Creator Wizard. I'm your host and referee. Today, we're talking about podcast sponsorships and the pros and cons of getting paid via CPM or flat compensation. First of all, what the heck is CPM? Well, it stands for cost per mil, meaning a set rate per thousand downloads. And these days, a lot of brands might try to pay around, you know, 25 to $30 CPM for a 60 second promo. So if you get a thousand downloads per episode, you can maybe buy a medium pepperoni pizza. And you might be thinking, Justin, I can easily find a pizza joint where I can get a large for less than 20 bucks. Look, I'm not talking about your local spot with 3.5 Yelp stars. I'm talking about five out of five quality pie. Anyways, CPM, maybe not ideal, but on the other hand, if your podcast starts consistently getting lots of downloads and more importantly, results for the right brands, maybe it makes sense. But then again, as an aspiring podcaster myself, I am more than my numbers. I can help brands in lots of other ways. You know, my alumni and my coaching students have told me that one of their favorite Justinisms is that you're not just a creator, you're a consultant who can help brands accomplish much more ambitious things. And for that kind of work, I'm going to need to be slid some guaranteed green. You feel me? But honestly, I'm still pretty confused about what my podcast sponsorship strategy should be. So that's why I asked two experts here today to settle this debate once and for all. Adam McNeil is the host of The Brew View, a weekly podcast all about coffee, kendama, and culture. But he's also the VP of marketing at Adopter Media, a podcast advertising agency that works with brands like Magic Spoon, Lomi, and Chili Sleep, to name a few. Danielle Desir Corbett, on the other hand, is the host of the Thought Card Podcast, founder of Women of Color Podcasters Community, and she's also a podcast marketing coach, helping overworked podcasters grow their audiences, improve their visibility, and make more money. So by the end of this episode, you'll know whether there are advantages to adopting different sponsorship pricing structures during different chapters of your creator journey, how to more clearly articulate your value to brands and agencies at the negotiating table, and honestly, the only thing I really care about who is a better creator debater, Adam or Danielle. So let's get into opening arguments. Adam, you're up first. Uh, You're both a creator and a suit. Well, you're you're not wearing a suit right now, but (laughs) you are behind the scenes, right? You're actually forging these partnerships. You're cutting these checks. So uh, tell us why you believe CPM pricing can be advantageous for creators. You have two minutes. Well, from looking at the e-com brand and being a podcast host and now sponsoring over 2,500 shows, I've learned that simplicity is key. Tracking brands to podcasting isn't easy. It's pretty hard, to be honest. It's a new medium for most brands and hard to grasp. There's a lot of issues with attribution. How does it even work? How do you even go about sponsoring? And so by using the same pricing model that brands are used to, which is CPM, if they're using Facebook ads, Google, or anything else, it makes it a lot easier to make that transition for them. So plus, you also have the upside upside as a creator of billing against your viral episodes, meaning that if you have an episode and you're normally doing a thousand downloads per episode and you have an episode that hits 50,000 because you had Mr. Beast on, you can bill against that and get paid a whole lot more. So uh, you get based the bill based on your results. And I think that's a valuable upside. All right. Nice and succinct. Danielle, um, it's your turn. Why are flat rate or custom sponsorships uh, a better idea in your opinion? Two minutes. You know, the cookie cutter approach of CPM just lacks flexibility and freedom. And as a creator, this is why we are in the game monetizing. We want that flexibility. We want that freedom. And we're able to set our own rates. Okay. I believe that with this custom sponsorship model, you are able to make more money over the life of each campaign that you're able to secure. Also, with this custom approach, you're able to go beyond the audio file. With a custom sponsorship, you can charge more, but you can also tap into other areas of your brand that these uh, brands are not even thinking about, like your newsletter and your social media, which are all assets that you can leverage in this campaign. 
You are not a commodity, all right? Your work and your influence is worth more than $25 per thousand downloads, especially if your show is under a thousand downloads per episode, which a lot of us fall under this, uh, this benchmark. Let's not forget the cost of podcasting, okay? The cost of editing one episode ranges from $25 to $200, maybe even upwards if you're going to have a video podcast. So tackling costs is something to think about when you are working with brands, okay? And the CPM model doesn't, does, doesn't leave really much room for a profit margin for smaller indie podcasters. On the brand side, I think that this custom approach leverages the bond that you've built with your listeners over the years, and they should be paying more for that. With an upfront investment also from the brand side, they're more invested in seeing this success of the campaign. It's not just, oh, you're one of like thousands, you're just spraying and praying. No, they're going to be invested. They want to get in front of your audience. You're most likely to be working together to commission this piece together. I love that about these custom sponsorships. Also, when you get paid more, you're more motivated. Like, I'm ready to wake up in the morning when I have a nice check at the end of the day. So overall, I definitely feel like custom sponsorship is the way to go. Very impressive. So um, I think this is a perfect uh, time to, to get into round one, which is all about uh, the negotiation, right? And so, Danielle, I want to start with you on this one. Um, when a brand uh, or an agency reaches out to you uh, pitching a CPM rate structure, uh, how do you articulate to them that flat compensation makes more sense or custom compensation makes more sense for both sides, two minutes. Sure, so I always thank them. Thank you for uh, presenting that to the forefront. But I always mention that my best performing podcast campaigns were always custom sponsorships where we're able to come together and figure out and drive results to whatever they're looking for. So being results driven is also very, very important. I also talk about how the CPM model doesn't take into account the other things that I'm willing to do uh, for this campaign, like writing a 2000 word blog post article that's SEO optimized, right? So that is going to command more dollars and then engaging my audience on social media, like, you know, doing reels and other just using my brand outside of just the audio file, like I mentioned before. At the end of the day, I always say that working through this model is a win-win-win for all of us. It's a win for me as a creator, it's a win for my audience, and it's also a win for the brand because, again, all of our assets and deliverables are pointing towards achieving success versus just thanks for $25. Interesting. Adam, um, what about you? Like When you're negotiating with a creator, um, is, is it common to... Uh, have pushback uh, on the CPM structure or just, just generally, how, how does that conversation go down? Yeah, sometimes, I suppose. Uh, and typically, I think that is with smaller podcasts that they would push back, partly because it's hard to, to incentivize someone to pay $25 if they're only going to get a 1,000 talents. So I can see that being the reality on that side. However, on scale, it doesn't make sense always. Uh, on scale, when you grow your podcast, the CPM does become a really impactful number there. On the other note there, CPM is highly incentivized in the sense that you don't have to think of it as a $25 CPM. In a lot of cases on smaller shows, you can bill at $100 CPM plus. Uh, you can price based off an affiliate model you might have started with. For example, when I ran my show, I started with an affiliate model. I worked with a brand, did affiliate sales for them. I generated over $5,000 in the first month on over 1,000 downloads per episode. Uh, for them, I was able to go back to them and bill at over $100 CPM per episode. And so you can justify those rates and make that production cost fit. And I think the problem that I think some people that are opposed to a CPM model see is that uh, they think that they can only ever get one sponsor per episode. Now, if you're able to fill up four or five, six sponsors per episode on a CPM model, you are far outweighing the costs that it might cost you to make your episode. And I think people overestimate the production costs sometimes. It's not always as expensive. And you can start with a lean model and grow that as you see. And as sponsorship revenue comes in, you can continue to grow that. The thing I love about CPM is it's a supply and demand model, meaning that if there's open inventory on your show, you can always come in at a lower CPM. And as more people want to get on your show, raise those numbers, bump that up, charge your existing sponsors more rates, and you can justify it as much as you want. You don't have to take $10. You don't have to take $25. You can tell them it's a higher number. And if it makes sense for the brand and you're generating results, they'll do it. Fascinating. And you know what? Uh, a little bit of behind the scenes uh, of, of why I launched this podcast, um, that point you brought up about having multiple sponsors uh, in one episode is 
uh, a, a phenomenon that does not really exist elsewhere in any other format. Like you'll almost never see multiple sponsors in a YouTube video or in an Instagram post. It's always like, okay, one sponsor I'm holding up. Ha, hint, you want to sponsor me, right? Like this type of thing, right? It's like you're, you're not holding like multiple brands typically, right? Um, 99% of the time, right? But with podcasting that it, it's, it's, it's destigmatized or it's just part, you know, natively built into the format. And so I think that that's actually very compelling. When I was looking at my own creator business and all the different content formats that I have, the newsletter, the YouTube, the social social, all this stuff too. I was like, you know what? Having a podcast could be a very critical component for me to have more negotiating leverage when I'm speaking with brands, uh, multiple brands, right? If I don't have, you know, spots elsewhere in, in my business for a brand that wants to, to partner with me. Right. So, um, I think that that's like a, a very interesting statement. So, uh, very interesting. That is the end of round one. So moving on to round two, I, I want to talk about uh, metrics. So Danielle, I want to go to you first uh, on this one. Uh, so uh, for your own uh, podcasts or, or when you're coaching other podcasters, uh, I'm sure that uh, the, the mindset piece comes into play a, a ton, right? Like, oh, I, you know, I can't pitch brands or get sponsorships because my numbers are super low or whatever, right? Um, and so how do you recommend creators get past that and tell a compelling story uh, around their metrics during conversations with brands? Two minutes. So the first point is that your numbers are your numbers. Do not hide them because at the end of the day, hiding your numbers is going to slow your progression with being able to secure this sponsorship. Remember that your show is not for everyone and that you are growing. One way that you can uh, highlight this is by using percentages. So instead of saying, I have 600, down, you know, 600 downloads, you can say that you've been able to grow from month to month. So using percentages could be a great way to highlight your growth overall. I also would encourage podcasters to let their media kit do the talking, meaning spelling everything out on their media kit, including your average downloads per episode, including um, all the things that sponsors want to know. You want to make sure that that's included in there. I also encourage podcasters to really get to know their audiences and not only of they're based in XYZ country or they're based in XYZ city. I mean, like, where do they shop? What do they value? What do they enjoy in their relaxed time? How much do they make also can be all drivers and indicators that can help you figure out what kind of sponsors you would want to partner with at the end of the day. Um, also, I want folks to think about what sort of impressive results they've achieved in the past for other brands that they've worked with. Have the past campaigns paint a picture for potential brands of what they could potentially offer and always be creative, meaning offer something new, fresh, interesting that will make the brand say, oh, OK, even though you might be small, you have the best idea. So let's go ahead and invest and see how this goes. Man, Danielle bringing out the psychographics, Adam. I, I know that maybe maybe you're pretty excited about this because I want to hear your, your your perspective on this. Um, you know, you actually uh, posted a Twitter thread recently mentioning uh, that you were vetting 500 different shows for potential sponsorships uh, this year. And so I was wondering if you could talk about the role that metrics plays uh, in in that decision making process and and how shows that don't have super strong numbers can advocate for themselves and, and still be attractive to brands. Yeah, that 500 is probably just that week. I feel like I'm betting hundreds every week and <laughs> wow. uh, okay. probably go through a few thousand in a year, at least maybe up to 10. However, uh, as much as I love pretty media kits, as much as I love all the, the glitz and glam that comes in from podcasters, it doesn't matter to me that much when I'm looking at your <laughs> Fighting show. words. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Two go ahead. Two of the things that I ultimately look for. Uh, above all... Uh, it's your track history of advertiser success. I'm going to use tools like Podscribe or Magellan or others or the software to check, do you have sponsors on your show? If so, have they been on your show for a long time? Have they been on for a short time? Does it look like they stick around? That's a good indicator to me to say that this brand is finding success on your podcast. Maybe a brand that I have that's similar in what they're looking for. Maybe they're looking to work with a podcast that has an audience of moms in their 30s. Great. This brand I know has that audience. My brand has that audience. I'm probably going to reach out about doing that sponsorship because they have a good track history there. Secondarily, that's where I look at how many downloads per episode do you get? Your a the age, gender, location of your listeners. Maybe I'll look at your psychographics. Is your audience particularly moms in the alternative health category? They're really all about certain ways of doing motherhood. Maybe that's a really good audience to tap into. And lastly, then it comes down to rates and packages. And that's the fundamental baseline that's a result of those other things. So for example, if you have a great advertiser history, you have exactly the demographics I'm looking for for my brand, you can probably justify a higher rate to me and I'll probably still bite. Uh, ultimately though, prove it out. Get a good advertiser track history and brands will come to you. That's the easiest thing that I look at. 
and it's the first thing that I see on a bad podcast that has no good advertising success. They have one ad this month, then three months later, they have another ad and they just can't seem to retain any podcast advertiser. That's not a brand I want to touch with a nine foot or podcast I want to touch with a nine foot pole. All right, Danielle, I'm sure you want to chime in on that one. Uh, but first, a word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by ConvertKit and their craft and commerce conference, which is happening June 8th to the 10th in Boise, Idaho. And tickets are going fast. This three-day event is designed to help you connect with fellow creators, learn from experts, and discover tools and strategies to grow your business. Craft and commerce includes inspiring keynotes, workshops, like one from me, meetups, live ConvertKit support, and social events. This is the perfect opportunity to gain valuable insights, network with your peers, and have a blast doing it. Right now, you can take Take $50 off your craft and commerce ticket. Want to bring a friend? You'll save even more. Go to conference.convertkit.com. That's conference.convertkit.com. All right. So, Danielle, I, I definitely want to get your thoughts on Adam's argument, because at least for me, it sounded like you were saying like it's like when you look at a job posting and it's like you're you're fresh out of college and it's like four years experience, like every job. It's like, how do you get the advertiser track record if you're just starting out? That That's my question, because it's like hard. Like, you know, it's like that. I feel like that methodology maybe benefits like people who have been doing it a long time. Maybe that's just the point. I don't know. Uh, uh, Danielle, what, what are your thoughts on Adam's uh, Adam's argument? I thought that was a great argument, but at the end of the day, I think it depends on how you approach sponsorships. Because like for me, I think of it as a bespoke customization. They're commissioning me and partnering with me to create this piece of content that they can actually go and put on their site, that they can actually go and use and showcase. So it's much more of a creative investment, even though I make it as easy as possible. But I just, for me, I think it just depends on the approach. That custom, bespoke, boutique hotel approach is like what I go for uh, versus kind of like this more bigger, uh, bigger box uh, strategy. Adam, you want to hear back? Let's hear it. You want, you want to uh, chime back in there? Absolutely. So uh, across the, the millions of dollars that we spend in the industry, most podcasts don't give the brands the ability to use their content. So most often, it's not actually a content-based integration that we're looking for. It is revenue generating, at least for the brands that we tend to work with and the brands that scale within the space. However, totally in alignment there, there are types of podcasts and there are podcasters that are leveraged for uh, the content creation side of things. And there's a place and a really great fit for that for certain brands when they're looking to use those and then blast on their social media, put paid dollars behind that to advertise that beyond. But when I'm looking at brands uh, that are trying to get a return on investment directly from the sales off of a podcast, then we have to look at it a little bit more on advertiser track history success. Um, one thing to add on, if you are a small podcaster listening and you're trying to get that first advertiser success story, start with an affiliate model. That's how I got started. Do an affiliate-based sponsorship where you were generating dollars based off of revenue that you're generating for the brand. It's zero risk to the brand, all the upside for you. You put out a couple ads, it shows up on your track history on Podscribe. You've done some commission deals. Now you have a proven track history and you can take the revenue data that you get from that, show that to a new brand and say, look how much revenue I drove for this brand. Here's the rate that I think would be justifiable for you. There we go. Nice and tactical. Thank you, Adam. Well, congratulations, you two. That is the end of round two. So let's get into round three. Uh, and I, what I think is actually a very critical part of this debate, which is how to handle change. Okay, so let's say that your podcast gets mentioned by a local news outlet or uh, a big influencer creator shouts you out uh, and all of a sudden uh, your listenership blows up or or maybe it doesn't even uh, have to be a massive step function. Maybe you've just been, you know, putting in the work for years and your numbers, you know, are have just steadily climbed month over month. Uh, like Danielle was mentioning, you tell me your percentage increase and all that stuff too. Um, and, and maybe uh, you've been working with some brands for a long time. How, how do you uh, go back to them and basically say, you got to pay me more money now, right? Adam, uh, have, have you ever had this happen, like a creator asking for a high, higher CPM? And A, what do you say to them? And B, uh, how do brands typically react to that that situation? Two minutes. Well, getting mentioned in mainstream media is really cool, but it does not equate to a higher CPM. If anything, it goes down in my books. Here's why. You just got an influx of brand new listeners that are not deeply connected to you. They heard about you in the news. They want to listen to a brand new episode. They are not deep in your influence funnel. They're not Patreon subscribers yet. They're not integrated into all the content that you've been dealing and dishing out for the past two years. You don't have the same ability to convert them for a brand as you would your core audience that's been with you for years. So overall, though you may have a higher download number, you can justify a higher flat rate or you'll typically get paid more uh, in Anum. However, uh, I wouldn't pay you the same CPM rate. I would typically drop that. 
So when podcasters come to me saying, look at all this mainstream news that we just got, it's actually not a great sign for me. It's typically a, hey, this is a brand new audience that's come to your show that you do not have full influence over yet. Fascinating. All right, Danielle, uh, your turn. Uh, I know you uh, have really ambitious goals of where you want to take your podcast. Uh, I'm curious, like, have you uh, mapped out your revenue strategy? I mean, is there value in not rocking the boat and just kind of cruising with the brands who believed in you from the beginning? Um, you have, uh, you know, that kind of consistent flat income that you can rely on every month? Or do you owe it to yourself to kind of try to renegotiate terms uh, at some point? And, and if so, how, how do you know when it's the right time? Two minutes. I believe in definitely revisiting, revisiting things. As we know, inflation is real, right? Things, egg prices have gone up. <laughs> uh, but heading back to like the topic at discussion, I look at I look at each project and each sponsorship and I qualify them. I ask myself, am I beginning to feel resentful with this partnership, meaning that I'm unable to pay my bills and feed my kids and I'm not as inspired financially incentive wise? Is it worth my time anymore? It's like two sides of a coin. There's the cost, income stability of having a sponsor that is steady, but also the opportunity cost. I can be maybe more fulfilled and have a bigger bank account as a result of just asking for more or seeing if this may not be a good fit. So qualifying all of your sponsorships at least once a year, um, your long term ones, I think is very important. And just to revisit how energized you feel. Um, I do think that it's important that closed mouths don't get fed, especially if you haven't raised your rates in two to three years and you have the results to match. It's important to just ask. And then you could have a conversation and dialogue to see, OK, does this make sense? Do we want to still stay committed in this relationship. It's a conversation. If you are thinking about raising your rates, though, do it tactfully. Don't be jarring and just say this or else. Maybe give them like 90 days notice or uh, a couple of months notice to really ease it in. Let them know that it's what you're thinking about. Uh, and I think that goes over a lot more well than just kind of just being jarring with the rate increase. My strategy over time is like steadily increasing my rates as I continue to find my voice, as I find more success with different types and styles of podcast campaigns. I can bring all of those findings, all of that energy, all of those learnings to each negotiation deal. A lot of times I am the one mentoring these brands that want to work with me because they have a vision of what they think podcasting is going to work. And I'm like, hey, 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 hold off. This is how it truly works. And that's based off of the years of experience continuously pounding the pavement there. So overall, continuously increasing your rates and show the results as to why you're doing that. Man, I, I, I haven't had to use the buzzer the entire time and you've I, I was about to use it, and then you stopped. So very impressive, Danielle. Uh, well, you know what, Adam, Danielle, it's time to make your final appeal. On the other end of your camera, on the other end of your microphone, is a creator who is relying on you to make this tough decision. Convince them why they should either negotiate CPM-based deals or flat compensation for their podcast sponsorships. Adam, you're up first. You have one minute. Listen, whether or not you use a flat rate or if you're going on a CPM deal, you should include CPM numbers in your deals because that is the metric that brands lean on. That is the metric that the brands that we all work with lean on and we spend over 10 to $20 million a year on podcast advertising. If you want to tap into those dollars as a podcaster, you need to be able to speak the language of the brands that are putting those dollars out there. So incorporate it in some capacity, whether or not it's scalable or you're using that as a flat rate metric. Secondly, keep it simple. Uh, brands do not like complicated. The more complicated you make your packages, the harder it is for a brand to say yes. I will easily bypass your brand or your podcast if you make it over complicated for me to sponsor because there's a hundred other podcasts that just make it easier by saying, here's my rate per episode, per download, etc. So keep it simple and use the language that brands are using and dollars will come and prove out your track history. That's it. All right, Danielle, you're up one minute. All right. So if you are looking outside of the CPM model, especially if your niche, they don't know what the CPM model is and what even podcast sponsorships look like. This is a great opportunity for you to custom these packages to their goals, their hopes, their vision and dreams. If you are looking to establish real relationships with these brand partners, then the custom sponsorship route may be the best option for you. Okay. 
It's also important with the custom sponsorships, you can allocate, uh, you can create custom packages that allocate to their budget and their marketing campaigns and what they're looking for and hoping for for the year. As an indie podcaster, especially with a small audience, I'm able to leverage all the things I do outside of my podcast and bring that in and bring that creativity to the forefront with the custom podcast sponsorships. If you have a smaller audience and you wanna be able to buy more than a couple cups of coffee, sure, go with the, the CPM route if you want. But again, if you wanna make a true living and you care about the brands that you work with and you want to help them achieve their hopes, dreams, and achieve your dreams as well, then the custom sponsorship route is the best route for you. Wow, thank you so much, Adam and Danielle. And now you, dear creator, watching and or listening, who won this creator debate? You can vote by clicking on the link in the episode description or letting us know on social media by tagging at Creator Debates, tag Adam and tag Danielle. Uh, and so Danielle, uh, hit us with the call to action. Uh, where can people learn more about you and follow you on social media? Sure, head over to DanielleDesir.com would be the best place to check out all of my different projects and check out my podcast, The Thought Card Podcast, if you're interested in travel and personal finance. Oh, and you can see examples okay. of sponsorships, okay? Custom sponsorships as well. <laughs> there we go. That's what I'm talking about. You know, uh, why I love following you, Danielle. Um, you make it feel so feasible and approachable to create uh, a sustainable livelihood as a podcaster. You know, there's so much noise around, oh, you gotta, you got to be on YouTube or TikTok or Instagram. Uh, you know, there, there's I think there's just still a massive amount of people who are diehard podcast listeners. And whether it's, you know, the grants that you highlight or, you know, your behind the scenes tips, uh, you're really giving tangible advice that that really makes a difference. So. So thank you for that. And Adam, uh, hit us with the CTA. I'll keep it short. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. That is the place that I live and breathe and post a lot of content. I do try to shed as much light as possible on the ad buying side of podcasting. I accidentally stumbled into podcasting both as a podcaster and as an ad buyer in the space. And I found both industries to be a little bit gatekept on information on how to get started, particularly on the ad buying side. It was a very gatekept industry. And I'm trying to change that one post at a time to help shed light on this industry that I've grown to really, really love. I love working with creators. I love sponsoring them. And so if you have a show that you think is ready for advertisers, message me or email me at adam at adopter.media. And I'd love to see if there's a possible fit for one of our clients. Look at that. You, you you didn't know after listening to this podcast, you might get a sponsorship after that. Boom. Love it. Uh, you know why I love following you, Adam. Uh, again, the fact that you're both the creator and on the business side, as you mentioned, and just kind of giving insight into what actually happens behind the scenes and how these campaign uh, recruitment decisions are made is just so critical. I think uh, sponsorship often sponsorships often feel like kind of a black box to a lot of creators, right? And so uh, the fact that you're just shedding light on, onto this stuff, I think is a huge service uh, to this space. So So thank you. Um, and finally, shameless plug, if you want to get paid sponsorship opportunities with brands, make sure to sign up for my free weekly newsletter at creatorwizard.com slash join. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, please subscribe, uh, leave a comment. Uh, if you loved it, if you hated it, that's also okay. You can let me know. You can tell me why. Uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks again. <laughs>